This is B2B Enablement, a Click.io podcast created to inspire sales and marketing leaders navigating digital transformation. I'm your host, Dave Carr, and on this show, we'll share actionable insights to build winning digital strategies and deliver better sales results with your customers. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 11 of B2B Enablement. And today we are talking about a topic that is a lot of fun for us, uh, which is sales enablement best practices. So today I'm joined by Paul Tkach, who is a senior sales leader at my company, Click.io. And we are going to dive into a host of things um, in terms of content, ideas, topics around how sales enablement is working for other leading companies in B2B and how you can apply those principles to your organization. Um, So I'm going to give Paul just a couple of quick seconds here to give an introduction to himself, and then we are going to hop straight into the topic. Thanks, Dave. I'm super excited to be here. I mean, I've been watching the and listening to the podcast uh, from the outside, but now it's kind of good to be on it here. So uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, it's uh, great to be on. So just some background information on myself. Uh, I've been here at Click since the inception um, and really kind of worked on both the sales and customer success side. So really working closely along a lot of our, the companies that we work with to help them deploy their sales enablement projects, their sales enablement solutions. Um, and so really over the past couple of years, I've got a good understanding of uh, implementing sales enablement solutions from uh, local deployments to global deployments and kind of seeing what works and what doesn't work. Well, what we're going to do is keep this really conversational today. And because Paul has sat in on both sides of the fence of sales enablement, number one, actually using sales enablement to sell our product and then also helping our customers deploy solutions. We're just going to talk really generally kind of a fireside chat about what's been working well and what sort of trends we really see in the marketplace. So, um, I know that from a listener standpoint, there may be people listening now that have a really good understanding of sales enablement and maybe some that are just beginning their journey. So let's start out by getting really basic. Let's just define sales enablement as a whole. And then Paul, if you can kind of tell us the differences between sales enablement as a function or operationally within a business and then sales enablement as a software. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, sales enablement is such a buzzword. It's been tossed around so much over the past couple of years. Uh, Really sales enablement is, I guess, the iterative process of empowering your team with the tools, the knowledge, uh, the data to really go out there and sell your products more effectively and efficiently. If we take a step back and and look at sales enablement, I think there's two real parts to it. We have sales enablement as a function, which is the process and the teams that are put together to help. And then you have sales enablement as a solution, which is the software that can help achieve a lot of that and save time. If we look at the the process and the sales enablement as a function, there's really a couple of teams and a couple of different stakeholders involved to help really achieve that that main goal of empowering your sales teams to go out there and sell your products more. And the teams that are involved, I would say, are marketing, you've got customer success, um, everything that really leads up to your sales reps going out there and getting in front of customers. So the content that they need, they need marketing to create that content so that it's effective. They need research done so they know who they're going into meetings with. So understanding buyer personas and ideal customer profiles. So really as a function is, I guess, the process of those teams coming together and understanding what's needed to help empower those teams. And then on the other side, you have sales enablement as a software and as a function, as a, uh, a solution, which really helps get a lot of those things done. So sales enablement solutions have been around for the uh, past 10, 15 years, and really they combine a lot of what's needed into a simple platform to allow teams to either train their users more effectively, streamline that digital content, align your teams together, uh, or maybe collect data on content that's being used when going into meetings. So those are really the two sides that we see of it. And uh, you typically need both to function really well and and excel at a high level. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And, you know, I've talked about this with a couple of other guests I've had on. uh, Jamie Kermis from LeadMD and I hopped into this back on episode number four or five. Um, And we really talked a lot about, you know, if you're not building the function in your business and the operational processes to empower sales enablement, uh, adding technology is really just, you know, it's shooting in the dark, right? <laughs> so it's bells it's, and whistles. Yeah. It's like adding pieces onto your car, nice bumper, nice kit, and you don't have an engine. Um, it's not going anywhere. It just looks fancy. 
It's an excellent, excellent analogy. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, if, you, if you're more interested in kind of learning about the functional side, I'm going to put some links in the show notes uh, for resources on checklists and how to build your sales enablement team. Uh, so if you're interested to dive more into that, we'll, we can get you some info there. Uh, but just to keep things high level here in the podcast, we've kind of talked about the functional aspect of sales enablement, the technological aspect, which is the software. Um but let's talk more about the application. So, Paul, I know, you know, one of the most common challenges that we see in B2B are teams that lack a connectivity between their sales and marketing organizations. Mm-hmm. And if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what you've seen in some of the clients you've worked with and then how sales enablement really can become the glue to bring those two functional groups together. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point and topic there. I think that in the past, and and we're still seeing it a lot more these days too, but there's a major disconnect between sales and marketing teams. Uh, I I mean, when it comes down to content, maybe communication, data, uh, sales sometimes feels like they might be uh, in a bit of a silo. They have content. They might know what content exists, maybe some older copies. They access that. And without really the knowledge uh, or the alignment of teams coming together, you don't really know what content might exist that you should be using uh, for what type of scenario. Marketing doesn't really have insights into uh, what sales is using on the front lines. Uh, And so really the disconnect from marketing and sales can create a lot of gaps within your process. So having your teams maybe not use the right or effective content when going into meetings, uh, and then marketing wastes time and money by continuing to produce more of that content because they think it's effective. Um, And so we've seen, I mean, I always go back to the saying that you can create the most effective and the best piece of marketing collateral in the world. But what good is it if nobody uses it or sees it or puts it in front of a customer? Uh, And so sales enablement as a solution has really been able to help align those teams and really create that closed loop system. So marketing knows what content is being used. Sales knows what content exists um, and they can keep making more of that content and and going into the market with it. Yeah, no, I I completely agree, man. Really good uh, assessment there. One of the things you touched on is producing content that never gets used. And one of the data points that we recently found doing some of our own research was 60% of content that's produced by marketers in the B2B world goes completely unused by your sales team. And as a marketer myself, I mean, that's a very alarming number. And I think for so many organizations that are spending, you know, potentially millions of dollars on their marketing activities and marketing content creation, you want to know that you're getting a return on that. And I think that the the advent of sales enablement and the ability to have insight into what's really going on in the field with salespeople uh, in terms of how they're using content and in conversations with their customers has been a real game changer. And the analytics of that are, are extremely powerful. And we'll talk more about uh, data as we get further into this discussion. But, you know, just the ability for salespeople themselves to understand how did my conversation resonate with a buyer after I left? So, you know, if I shared with him five pieces of of collateral, a presentation, brochures, spec sheets, whatever, was that something that even resonated with that particular buyer? Um, And on the note of of the buyer, there's been so much discussion about how COVID alone has impacted the buyer journey. But even prior to COVID, you know, the data showed that, you know, up to 70% of the customer buying journey happened before that particular person ever made contact with sales. And that's raised a huge uh, concern for B2B companies who historically had not had the most robust marketing teams because that first 70% is really more influenced by marketing. Um, But Paul, if you could tell us a little bit about what you've seen in that buyer journey and how you've uh, interacted with some of our clients and how has COVID really changed or accelerated that um, in the sense of where sales enablement can fit in? Yeah, for sure. I think that, I mean, obviously it's a, a very interesting year for sales. Uh, missing the handshakes, you don't get those face-to-face meetings anymore, those in-person meetings, uh, which is obviously a lot easier to convey emotion or points or or just get topics through, right? Things you don't typically see or feel in maybe a Zoom meeting or a phone call, uh, you miss out on that. So I think that, that, I mean, that's the first thing really this year that's been impacted is we're seeing a lot of 
teams to be forced to use technology that they wouldn't use before. Like, uh, every, like Zoom, Zoom, for example. And I think everyone has that Zoom fatigue now where they, it was a little bit exciting at first and you got together with your teams on a, uh, like a weekly basis to, to do your happy hours or whatever. But now I think everyone is starting to, to get that fatigue. So one, sales adapting to that is difficult. But even before COVID and, and having all of this year mixed up, I think we were already seeing a, a, an environment and a landscape that was changing drastically. So, I mean, the internet, for example, I mean, nothing revolutionary right now. It's been here for a while, but uh, a lot of our buyers are now a lot more informed than they were before. So there's so much more competitive information available. There's so many resources online. Um, and I think one of the good the stats from Salesforce that they did last year was uh, 80% of buyers view at least five pieces of content before uh, interacting with uh, a seller or, or a trusted advisor. And so that's a big deal, right? Knowing that I'm going into a meeting today, I need to be an expert on what I'm talking about. I need to be prepared on questions I might be asked. I might, might need to be readily available for cross-selling or upselling opportunities. Um, and so the bar is raised a lot higher for sellers to really have the tools or the information on hand so that they can answer questions and provide their customers uh, with the right answer or the right solution for, for their problems. So I, I think, in a, I mean, before COVID and before this all got mixed up, we were already seeing uh, quite a drastically different landscape uh, with um, buyers, but now it's, it's definitely been shaken up a bit more having to do this all through Zoom uh, video or phone calls. Yeah, I completely agree. And how have you seen sales enablement sort of fit into that as in terms of the way that that the, the customer interactions are changing and the way that salespeople are changing? How has sales enablement sort of, I guess, changed the game, if you want to say? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. And I mean, I, I, I'm biased. I'm not biased, but I use it on a daily basis. So, I mean, I have a really good understanding of it. Um, but what really, there's two benefits that I draw from it immediately. One comes to this personalization. And two is the analytics and data around content I share or my customer's engagement. Uh, and starting on personalization, what sales enablement helps me with there is really uh, personalize the messages for every step of the buyer's journey. So sales enablement can align well with your buyer's journey in a way that content is presented based off of where your, your prospect or your customer might be. So if they're in the awareness stage, I know that when I go to look for content, I'm looking for content that might be within that awareness stage. And sales enablement does a really good job of narrowing down that content based off of the buyer's journey. So immediately, I'm already personalizing a lot of my outreach based off of maybe the, the industry that this company is a part of, whether what, what part of the buyer's journey they're at, uh, maybe the types of products they sell. And so that I guess taking a step back, sales name really just provides that information to me immediately so I can personalize. Then on the flip side, when I do start sharing that content out with my customers on outreach or my prospects, analytics and data allows me to focus on opportunities that might be more worthwhile or focus on follow-ups with more information or more accurate information. And so by using a sales enablement solution, when I share out content with a prospect or a customer, I'm able to actually see how often they've opened the content. Uh, if I've shared three pieces, which content pieces have they looked at the most out of those three? And then the duration they've spent on each piece of content. So for me on sales, that's extremely valuable when I have a lot of outreach um, and, and I'm emailing on a frequent basis. basis. I want to see who's engaging with the content I'm sending over and what content they're engaging with. That's going to help me make a better timely follow-up. So actually get them maybe on the phone when they're near their computer or it's top of mind for them and actually know what they were looking at so I can focus the conversation or my follow-up on that specific piece. So personalization and data are really two ways that have been helping me throughout um, COVID right now um, and a lot of the other teams that we work with as well. Yeah, and what I like so much about those two is that data fuels personalization. Yeah. And I mean, and I the same for me. I mean, you know, in using a software system like sales enablement, it, it just lets you have it's such a better way to make decisions. And it's almost giving salespeople the ability to look around corners and, you know, behind what previously was, you know, the 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 shroud of what's yeah. really going on with your buyer. And I think there's three there's three real data point um three real uh, analytic points that are valuable for for three different teams, which is marketing, sales, and then administration, right? So if we look at the data and the analytics for sales, which is what I just spoke about, I'm now equipped. I can see my customer's engagement. I can make better follow-ups and more accurate follow-ups. 
But then if we look at marketing, we can see marketing now has insight into content, what's working, what's being used or looked at the most, and they can keep building more of that. And then for administration or maybe managerial level uh, uh, individuals, they would be able to see what conversations or what content is being used leading up to opportunities. And then they can train more on, on uh, certain content pieces that are working or uh, maybe it change their process a little bit depending on what content is building up to those opportunities. So really insight across the table for, for each team there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to bring all of these kind of advantages and points back home because we could nerd out for hours, you know, talk, yeah. <laughs> talking about the individual, uh, you know, benefits of sales enable and all the cool things you can do with it. But to getting back to the best practices, I think that, you know, the companies we see that are really being the leaders on this front are the ones who are taking those concepts and applying it in ways that they're building sales enablement as a, as a bolt on piece of their full tech stack. So yeah. making sales enablement connected to your CRM, that's just the most elementary ground floor level, right? So pulling that data into your CRM system, marrying that up with your existing customer records, uh, allowing the CRM system to feed sales enablement. So, you know, solutions like ours and many others on the market, you know, you can actually allow CRM like salesforce.com to use attributes to automatically narrow down content in your sales enablement systems so that salespeople have those recommended conversations. Um, so from a best practices standpoint, it's you know using all the cool gadgets and really getting it baked down again into your operations process. And I'll harp on that again. So again, you know it's just it's so important to build the functional team in your organization who can yeah. pull that together. Uh, but that's where the magic happens is when you you take that data and and you're using it for personalization and and really driving the the sales cycle versus being a passenger along the way. Um, and so yeah. on that point of of sort of driving, you know, empowering reps, you know, training and onboarding are always things that we hear a lot from potential clients around. Hey, how can sales enablement improve? the way that I train my reps or how quickly I can onboard a rep. So can you give us just a couple of examples of how sales enablement can accomplish those things and maybe even a real life example of, of one of the clients that you've worked with? Yeah, I think training, I mean, you need to have the function before you have the solution. That's that's a, a given for sure. I think that when it comes down to training processes and onboarding processes, this is where we see uh, teams either go strong and or, or fail early on, right? I think that in the beginning, you need to have a process that really outlines uh, what your team should do with that software, how it works with your CRM. Um, and often teams, uh, teams at corporations, we see just kind of throw solutions over the fence and hope that they work. And this is not the way that tools should be implemented. There definitely needs to be a blueprint outlined, which is something that we always hand our customers. So really outlining uh, fundamental goals of the project, right? So when we're implementing a sales enablement solution, what are we trying to achieve with it? Uh, what are the end goals? And then maybe what are some KPIs that we want to uh, focus on? So I mean, I, for example, we just did a deployment in January um, with a, a big industrial manufacturing company. And, and one of their main goals was simply to just access content quicker and know where it's at. And, and I think that defining Finding a lot of that before you actually get involved with a project is a big, big part of it. Um, and so really that kind of goes down to the onboarding side of things. And then when it comes to the, the training aspect of uh, sales enablement, you can really set up your team for success by outlining a lot of your training within your sales enablement solution or platform. So that comes down to really maybe having a category inside of your platform that is identified and can hold all of your training content. And then teams can navigate through that, that content based off of filters or keywords to, to maybe get onboarded quicker. Another way that we help teams really focus on training and upping their skills is through the use of conversations. And conversations is essentially a package of content together on a certain topic. And we've seen a lot of teams use conversations in a really effective way for training. Being able to maybe provide um, a full holistic view uh, and understanding of a product or a solution 
but then also include uh, coaches. So maybe other people within this company who have sold this product for successfully or who might know a little bit more about it than I do, they can share their best practices or tips either in the form of a document there or they can, we've seen teams do a great job of a one-minute uh, selfie recording on an iPhone or, or just a recording off of a laptop, really talking about value propositions of products or offers. Um, so that's one way to do it too. Another way we see teams uh, really ramp up training is with ideal customer profiles or buyer personas inside of sales enablement. So a lot of great teams will actually create a document for their buyer personas uh, or a PowerPoint for their buyer personas. Uh, and what this does, it, it can go into the conversations bit too, is really empower your team to understand who they're going into a meeting with today. Maybe what questions they should ask, uh, what topics are most important to them or relevant to them. Uh, and those types of things, really combining some of the best practices uh, from people within your company uh, alongside the buyer personas r is really, really great for in training and getting people onboarded and up to date a lot quicker. Yeah, that's that's right on. And again, coming back to the best practices side of that, as you can see, it's it's the thoughtfulness and the planning of what do we need to put in the tool. And so that always leads to where you need to be. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, a sales enablement system is a lot like a blank canvas, and, and it is sort of what you make it. Um, most of the systems out there, including ours, are, are customizable. So understanding up front what your goals as an organization are, where you know your gaps are in training, or where you've seen sales reps struggle in the sales cycle. Maybe there, maybe you need to be delivering more training up front because, you know, sales reps aren't properly qualifying or getting interest with clients, or maybe it's at the end of the sales cycle and they're not, you know, navigating the uh, negotiations and the proposal stages of the buying cycle. So uh, I think that's really what I like about sales enablement is that it, it is what you make it. And it is that thoughtful sure. planning up front that helps deliver um, success overall. Um, so uh, uh, kind of getting down to our last questions here, uh, Paul, we talked earlier about data and analytics. And in the modern world, I mean, we all know that data is power. Um, how do you see industry leaders in sales and marketing using sales created data? And how is sales enablement being a part of that and empowering that data, uh, not only creation, but the data analysis? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, everything seems to be about data and analytics these days. It's data, 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 the more we can collect, right? Um, and so leaders are using that as effectively as they can to make their business decisions. I mean, if we look at it from maybe a best practices for sales enablement, what we're seeing data point to when using sales enablement is we can really identify who are our top performers in the company. So who's closing deals and what content are they using? And for sales alone, I think those are two really valuable pieces that we've seen, right? So the ability to look at top performers, understand what they're doing, maybe some of their habits or their practices, and share that with the rest of the team, whether it's them training the rest of the team or providing a video or a document that tells talks a little bit about their best practices or habits, um, or embedding that into the process, right? So just taking what they're doing well. Um, the other part of that too is the marketing assets, right? So we talked to the, the, the collateral uh, and what's working. So now we have the ability to see content and actually see how it's performing. And so marketing before would kind of just create content, toss it over the fence and hope that sales used it. But now with the sales enablement solution in place, we can actually measure that. We can say this marketing asset has been used X number of times and has actually led to this many of opportunities and, and this dollar value in pipeline. And then marketing can take that data into consideration and begin fueling more of that, right? Begin making more of that content that works well and focusing on that content and reducing their efforts on maybe other pieces that weren't as effective, whether it, it's a video that's performing well or whether it's certain topics. Um, so for sales and marketing, those are really the two uh, value adds when it comes to data and analytics. Um, and I think that from, I mean, a holistic level already provides uh, managers and, and the managerial level with the ability to kind of uh, one-up their team and, and figure out what they can optimize to make better. Um, and, and so I think that, that those two pieces right there are already uh, massive pieces when it comes to sales enablement. 
collecting that data is, has been proven to been inv- invaluable to a lot of the teams that we're working with right now. Yeah, completely agree. And the biggest thing to me is ROI. And, you know, having the data and understanding, you know, where did we get a return on our, on our investment from a marketing content perspective, but also just all of the things that you can do with that data along the way. Um, and, and again, you know, as a marketing nerd myself, I mean, I think about the ways you can use that in marketing automation. Um, you know, the prior organization I was with, we were using sales enablement. We were also using Pardot and yeah. we were taking the data from sales enablement to look at, okay, what sales conversations are actually happening in the field? Who are those salespeople? Who are the prospects and the clients they're interacting with? And then how can we give sales air cover with our marketing automation campaigns using the insight and the intelligence from the sales enablement system? So, you know, as far as, again, best practices and tips, and that's one immediate way that marketing can get a tremendous amount of value and and sales as well, right? Because now you've got marketing, again, giving the air cover and helping you from either a brand awareness standpoint or a customer qualification standpoint, figuring out where you're most likely to to close your deals. So, so yeah. much we could talk about on that front. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I think that that's where that alignment comes into play, right? I mean, before we were seeing a lot of disconnect between sales and marketing teams, but now that insight and that ability without having to book one hour meetings every week or two hour meetings every week to get that data, each team has insight now into data and what's going on. So, I mean, you really are bringing those teams together and, and aligning them. Well, Paul, I know we could talk for hours about sales enablement in, in all sorts of nerdy ways. <laughs> But uh, in classic form, if you listen to this podcast, you'll know that I always try to to come back around to kind of three to four big points that you could use to actually take away and take into action in your business. So, Paul, for listeners out there who are more uh, interested in actually getting something done, if you could give us sort of three big key takeaways about sales enablement, best practices and how to start, what would that be? Yeah. So I think just based off the conversation, some, some just summarizing it, I think that what we've noticed, and especially with this year with COVID kicking in, uh, that the landscape for sales has changed drastically. We need to be more informed. The bar has been raised a lot higher. We need to go into conversations um, knowing our stuff. And so I think that that also brings up a very big case for sales leaders to have the right tools in place for their teams. So one, sales being empowered and prepared, but then that really comes from having those right tools in place. Uh, two, I'd say that I think having a plan, right? Having a tool is good, but really having a plan that goes with that tool to support it, deploy it, get people onboard, trained, and actually embedded as part of your process uh, is extremely key. Uh, and I think the last thing that's probably easiest to go into off of that would be uh, starting small. A lot of teams try and take on a big deployment. Um, so really focus on going far and wide really quickly off the start. But what we see work best works best is starting locally, starting small, and then and then scaling up and growing. So I think that those are probably the three three takeaways that I could summarize. Three very solid points, and I could not agree more, especially on the last one, which is you know keeping things manageable. Um, you know, in the startup world, I mean, we talk about MVPs all the time, right? But I think that's such a good way to look at any sort of sales enablement launch, um, especially if you're building a small team. So you know, really looking at what's going to fit your organization. Is it going to be one person doing this, you know, splitting tasks between marketing or other sales processes? Are you going to hire a full-time sales enablement person? Um, Are you going to hire multiple sales enablement uh, personnel? So all of those things have to play in, but however you start, do it in a way that allows you to start small and scale out. So really good points. Um, well, with that, I know uh, we could talk for a lot longer, but uh, for those of you that are listening uh, that have joined our podcast before, we thank you for coming back. Uh, if you have not done so already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button uh, and give us a good rating if you're finding this content useful. Uh, those ratings are how other users find us, so we certainly appreciate that. Um, but Paul, we really appreciate you joining for the chat today, and uh, we hope to see you back maybe on a subsequent ex- episode uh, when we yeah. go <laughs> go a little deeper into sales enablement. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me today. It's always exciting, and I could go on for hours. So <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be on. Great. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Talk to you next time. Yeah. Thanks, guys. 